Praise the Lord. I am grateful to be standing before you all one more time. I am uh, glad to be seeing all your faces this morning. Um, I have a uh, little bit of a uh, long uh, topic or to uh, cover today, so I'm going to just dive right into it. So let's read Acts chapter 17. Verse 23. Actually, I'll read 22 and 23. Acts 17, 22 and 23. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription. To the unknown God, whom ye therefore, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So, Minu uh, spoke about this last week um, and talked about this passage about this famous speech by Paul in a place called Mars Hill, and it was in Athens, and. It was very famous because he's speaking to a crowd of philosophers and educated men. And he was in this place, uh, I believe Areopagus, and he was seeing all these idols and all these things and it grieved him so deeply in his heart. And he stood on, went up to the midst of this place and he spoke uh, to the, the supposedly educated people there and is saying... Uh, you're also educated, but you're ignorantly worshipping this unknown God. And there was an inscription next to an idol that says, to the unknown God. So he's saying, all of you know the not, truth of God in your heart, that there is such a God. Uh, we talked about in Sunday school today in Romans chapter 1, verse uh, 18 to 20. It says that the invis- uh, you know, everybody knows the knowledge of God in their heart. Right? So he's saying, you know the knowledge of heart, and you ignorantly worship this unknown God, this invisible God that uh, you say you don't know. I am here to declare this invisible God to you. But my focus today is the, what he said there, the phrase, you ignorantly worship. So, uh, so if you look at and I don't recommend, I don't think it's necessary to understand the Greek or the Hebrew. And, you know, some people are very focused on knowing the root meaning of something. And God has given us the Bible in our own language. And a literal reading of that is sufficient to understand, um, understand what he meant. But sometimes uh, there is, there's limitations in the English language. And... We had to under, sometimes it's important to understand the context and what he meant because uh, that implies different meaning. So the word here that he used is for worship is called Eusebios. If you can put up my first slide. Um, so the word uh, here that he used is the word Eusebios. He's saying, uh, actually the next one. Uh, so he's saying that I see that you have these idols and you're Eusebiosing or worshipping this false or, or this unknown God. And I came to declare him to you. So bear with me. So if you look at the word Eusebio, it means to be reverential, to be devout or respectful. And behumanike, uh, right? So you know somebody is important, there's something important there, and I feel like I had to be you know, respectful and reverence that person or thing. So he's saying, you're, you say bioing this ignorant, uh, igno- ignorantly you say bioing this unknown God, you know there's a being there that you need to worship, and you're doing this. So interestingly, uh, Jesus used a similar word, I think it's a derivation of the same word, so he's speaking uh, about the Pharisees in uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, uh, well actually verse uh, 7, 8, and 9. 
he says, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, you, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of man. So he's saying, these Pharisees, you're hypocrites. You made up a bunch of rules to make you think you're worshiping God, the true God. But in fact, and the word there is sabo. It's a, I believe it's a der derivation of the other word, but I don't know. But he's, it's the same meaning. Is that you're pious, you're devout, you're religious, and you are, you know, behumanikyo, adharikyo. Like you're respecting this God, but it's in vain because your heart is far from me. It's not true worship. So I believe Jesus intentionally used this different me word there, meaning you all are not really worshiping the true God. All you're doing is doing something you do for somebody in a high position. So let's say you meet the president or an important person, you might do the same thing. If you meet a king, you might do the same thing. So he's saying, and it's an, an indictment of their hypocrisy, saying you made all these rules and uh, all these false doctrines to satisfy your conscience, but you, all you're doing is no more than the respect that you would give to an important person. And the reason I'm saying this is to bring that indictment to our church. When I say our church, not just Hebron, but our, the modern church today. Because I believe that in many ways we are Eusebio or Sabo, or when we say worship, that's what we're really doing when we worship God. We honor Him and respect Him as if He's an important person, but is that really what the true worship that we see when people had a real revelation of who Jesus is, what their response was. Because I'll talk about this later. In reality, worship is not something you just decide to do and do. Worship is a natural response in the face of the revelation of the true God. It's meaning there's no other choice that you have that, you're, that you automatically... Worship God. But what does that mean? Right? So let's turn to, because you have to go to the uh, future to really understand what it means. So Revelations chapter 5, verse 11 through 14. Revelations chapter 5, 11 through 14. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down, and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. So, what's happening is, Revelation chapter 4 shows a vision of God in all His glory sitting on the throne. And it's a picture of just an absolute radiance of God and His glory. And it says, it describes all the jewel and all the rainbow that was around Him. And, and it shows the beasts and the elders. I'm not going to go into all of that. Uh, and then fast forward in chapter 5, there's a book in the right hand of the one on the throne, which is Christ Himself. And you can see the glory of Christ. And also, but they see that there was no one worthy to open the seals of the book. 
and it says, who will open this book for us? Who is worthy? And suddenly they see a lamb as if it was slain. And, and this lamb was none other than Jesus himself. They see a vision of the two roles that Christ played as God on the throne, as a judge worthy to be worshipped, and God uh, and Christ the lamb that was slain for us. And when the people that are in his presence see the true reality, faith, when they're confronted face to face with the lamb that was slain, when they see that in, 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 in person, their only natural reaction is to fall down before God and worship him. And they sing blessing and honor and glory. All the angels, millions and millions of angels and all the creatures that were there fell down before God and worshipped Him completely. And they sang from the, their heart blessing and honor. And worthy are you to receive our honor. So the word, if you go to my next slide, there's a different word that is used for worship there. That word is preskinio in Hebrew. And if you look in the Old Testament, the, sorry, Greek, and in the Old Testament, the Greek word is saha. You can look it up. And if you find, prove me wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. You can tell me later. Um, but everywhere, and I keep a list um, of wherever worship is mentioned in the Bible. Every time, it is this. It is when people receive a revelation or a knowledge of God. In, uh, in the Gospels, when the demons saw Jesus, when they were in his presence, they bowed, they worshipped him. It's the same word, perskinio. They bowed down before him and said, do not torment us before it's time. Or when, when there's uh, people who were healed, when they saw and realized who Jesus was, their only natural reaction was they bowed down before him and worshipped him and said, truly you are the Son of God. So, the, my point is, when you have a revelation, when we have a revelation of Christ, of who He is and what He did for us as the Lamb that was slain, our natural reaction response is to bow down. Well, I'm not, okay, again, first of all, I'm not talking about a physical action here, okay? Because it'll be like going back to what Jesus told the Pharisees. You know, we make up all these things to mimic true worship. But it begins with your heart. Is to, to completely surrender to, the, to Christ when we have a true revelation of who He is, of the glory in heaven. They, uh, they had no choice but to worship Him. That's why in Romans, uh, I believe 14, it says, Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Whether you're an unbeliever or believer, Everyone who was created, every creature, when they are faced and confronted with the true glory of Christ, they will naturally worship. It is because they have, they are, our sin has separated, we're separated that people don't worship. Right? We don't have a knowledge of His glory. We don't have an understanding of His glory. That's when we, the, I'm talking about general, you know, people, unbelievers or believers. But I, one day it will happen when we're confronted, whoever it is, believer or unbeliever now, when they're confronted with the true glory of Christ, well, they will naturally bow down and worship Christ. All the world false religions are about this creating false idols that the devil has snared people to bow down worshiping for false idols. This is what they're doing, surrendering to a false idol to a false glory and a, a, a perishing glory, bowing down to worship. But that is, that's what Paul is saying. You're doing this ignorantly, but this is not true worship. Okay, so now, but what, so but that, this was a heaven, but what about now? What about today? Right? So, so what happened to, today is, so go to the next uh, slide if you will. I'm just going to a little bit of a science lesson. Um, so, I look at it like a solar eclipse. Hopefully many of you studied this in, in, uh, in school. So, what happens when the solar eclipse happens is 
you know, so the moon revolves around the, the moon revolves around the earth, right? Okay. Um, and the sun, uh, so the earth revolves around the sun, right? So every so often, it perfectly lines up that the moon is in front of the sun and the part of the earth is blocked out from the sun. Okay, so then what happens is, at that point, a solar eclipse happens. You all with me? You're wondering what the point of that is. So a solar eclipse happens when you can't see the full brightness and glory of the sun. Yes? So the same way we are in our state today, in our sin, right? The world is corrupted, cannot see the true glory of Christ because our sin has separated us from God. So we can't, we don't truly worship Him in our natural state. That's why in 1 Corinthians, uh, in that chapter written to dysfunctional churches, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, it says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also I am known. So he's saying we, it's the same concept. We can't see God right now. It says no man has seen God face to face. But we see him as if, you know, like in a glass darkly. But in that time, we will see fully. Right? This is what's happening today. So, so, so how do we worship then? Right? What does this mean? So uh, let's turn to... John chapter 4. So, John chapter 4, uh, verse 21 through 24, I'll read that real quick. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship no, you know not what. You, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Okay, now every Malayali Pentecostal says this at least once in their lifetime. Right? Because we believe certain things about worshiping in spirit and in truth. So I'll come back to that. But I am really uh, just mind blown that Jesus just revealed such deep truth about worship and spiritual things to this poor Samaritan woman. This is the woman at the well. This poor Samaritan woman who not only was she a so-called nobody, she was actually um, a, in, entangled in sexual sin. Okay, she said, Are you, you're right, you're not married, you have five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband, right? So she was... Supposedly somebody Jesus should not even be looking at or talking to. And yet here we are. Jesus is opening the truths of the gospel to her and saying this is deep truth that if you want to truly worship God, you can only do that in truth and in spirit. Then now mind you, that when it says worship there, the word Greek word again is the word proskynios, which is bowing down before him. Okay? Bowing down before him. Completely surrendering to him and submitting to him. That is the word that Jesus said. But now what does this mean? So remember the solar eclipse that we cannot connect to God physically. We can't see God physically at this point. And Jesus himself came down. I think Justin said that a couple of weeks ago. He's a true image of his glory. He's a brightness of his radiance. Jesus himself 
it represents who God is. And when we see Jesus for who he truly is, we see God. Right? But God is saying, it is only through your spirit while we're in this world that we can worship him. That means his spirit connects with our spirit. That's why Apostle Paul says, I worship him with my spirit. It is only through our spirit that we can worship God. And not only that, it's only in truth. So if you have to worship him truly, you have to worship him in truth and in spirit. That means when we realize that there's nothing we can hide from God, just like this woman who had his whole life revealed to her by Jesus, and then she realized this is somebody different. Her life was changed and later brings the whole town to Christ, right? So this woman's whole life was unraveled to Christ. And so when we come to God in truth, not in hypocrisy, not, I didn't say uh, without sin. I said come to God not hiding your sin. Don't be like Adam and Eve who covered their sin with fig leaves, but come to God and lay your lives before him. Allow him to sanctify you, but worship him not in hypocrisy, but worship him in truth. And finally, allow his spirit to connect with your spirit to worship him. That is the only way. That it has to start there and then it transforms your mind or your soul and your body. But it has to start at the spiritual level. You cannot go the other way. So if you go to the next slide, see the problem with modern worship is, uh, this is my last point, is I, this, uh, Josiah was like, you're going to show this picture again? He like, rolled his eyes. Oh, so I've, you guys have seen this picture a couple of times. It is so, so, shows so many truths. We're like this iceberg. Most of it is under the water. You can't see most of it, right? So what happens is when we try to worship God, we come to him with that words and actions. We sing and we, we, we do all these things, but it doesn't start at a spiritual level. It doesn't start from the depths of our heart. It starts, but in fact, we allow feelings and emotion that dictate our worship. We get worked up when we sing a nice song, or in Malayalam we sing a fast song, everybody claps their hands uh, fast and sing, say some, uh, uh, speaks in other tongues, and they think that is worship, but it, it does not line up with the truth that Jesus told the woman. You can only worship him in truth and in spirit. It has to start at the spiritual level and transform from the inside to the out, not from the outside to the in. And what happens is when, it's the same concept, because when your spirit, that's why Paul told the Ephesian and the Colossian church, I pray that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, that you might know the height and the breadth and the depth of God's love. So it's the same prayer that we should have. Open my eyes to see your true glory. Let me see who you are. Let me see that vision of you. And then as we're changed, from glory to glory, transformed. See, all of these things mean and link together in 2 Corinthians, whoops, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says, we're transformed from glory to glory. As we increase in the knowledge of Christ, as we grow spiritually and, uh, and the knowledge of Christ increases in us, our worship is transformed more and more into a true worship. What do we try to, uh, the worship team, please come forward. If we try to go the other way, just dwell in the realm of emotional and feelings and just try to cover up our sins and not come to God in, uh, in openness and allow Him to transform us, we're just fooling ourselves. We're doing Eusebio and Sabo, just like the people who are ignorantly worshiping uh, this unknown God. So let us flip this back. This is, that's why it links to everything we've been saying over the last couple of years. When you abide in His presence, when you spend time in private prayer and strengthening those, when you meditate on His Word, without you knowing, the knowledge of Christ grows in you. 
you see a true revelation of who he is. This ties back to what I said a few weeks ago about praises. That, you know, it's out of the depths of our heart that praise should come. Right? So, so all of these things, we can't praise your way to true worship. It has to be the other way around. Praise comes out of a heart filled with worship and gratitude and thankfulness and praise and awe and reverence to God. It comes from the inside of us when we connect to the Spirit of God, when we discipline ourselves, when we focus on Christ, then everything else dims away and we see the true glory of God. Let us come back to the true heart of worship. Let us come back to be a true worshiper of Christ. May his name be glorified. Let's all rise to our feet.